All right, so now we begin. Uh, I have to give a little bit of background to this. I really do. Did you ever do anything wrong for a really long time? And like you were just convinced that you had been doing it right the whole time? Oh, yeah. Leland? I did that one time. One time. <laughs> So in this particular instance, like this is one of those things like people will ask me, you know, how do I select what I'm going to be preaching on? And I have to be completely honest with you guys. I don't take credit for making these selections. I don't. I try and look out into the world. I try and look into in our individual lives and see the things that we're struggling with and those things that we're struggling with. Then I go to the Word of God and I try to find an answer for those things. And then when the Word of God has an answer for those things, I really think it's important for us to share because this is one of those instances where, like, I am guilty of doing something wrong, but I was convinced I was doing it right for years. And then somebody said, hey, why don't you do it like this? And I thought, dang, that's better. <laughs> and, and, and because I'm guilty of that, I know that some of you are guilty of that, whether you want to admit it or not. So tonight we're going to be talking about how we do church. Today, I'm sorry I said tonight. Today we're going to be talking about how we do church. And in order to, to have that conversation, I'm going to take you back to the book of Matthew. We're going to start in the book of Matthew because it's the first book in the New Testament. And I want you to see how the first century did church. I want you to see how the word of God tells us we're supposed to do church. And, and then when we leave here, I don't want anybody to feel like I'm telling you you've been doing it wrong your entire life and you should be doing it this way. Instead, what I want you to think is I want you to understand, I want you to know that I'm guilty. Like I have done things wrong and I have done things wrong. And then when it came to my attention that I was doing them wrong, the first instinct, the human instinct is, no, I'm not wrong. You're wrong. Right? Somebody said amen. Amen. Okay, all right. And in this particular instance, I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that I'm trying to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. I don't want you to feel that way. I don't. I want you to feel motivated and encouraged that the Word of God cares enough to tell you how we're supposed to do it. And then I want us to agree that God's right. And when God is right, whether we've been doing it that way all our lives or for five minutes, we should stop and say, okay, let's go back and do this God's way. Yeah. So this is one of those things, ladies and gentlemen, like I'm, I'm not up here to really entertain you. I don't, I don't think that I'm funny. Connor's funny. Jill's funny. Faith, I'm sorry. <laughs> she takes after her dad. I'm not up here to entertain you. I really am up here to get us to open the word of God. To, to read through the word of God and to leave here more like Christ created us to be. So uh, I'm glad that when we, we do occasionally have laughs and smiles that we're doing that in an effective way because God gave us those things. If you want to follow along in your bulletin under the reading of the scriptures, we're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. All of the scripture verses are listed there. I tried to keep this short. I tried, and I think we're going to get out of here before noon. So, happy Father's Day. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that God's here with us. Before we begin, I'm going to ask Brother Virgil, would you mind saying a prayer for our service? Father, thank you so much for Okay, so we're going to begin Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to be, well, you can see if you're looking in the book, we're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 4, chapter 10. We're going to be in Ephesians 1 and then in 1 John 2, and then we're going to be done. So 
I'm starting at the very beginning. I really am. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And this is, this is really key here, ladies and gentlemen. So this is, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And, and, and I want you to see that this is, this is the event that culminated in him moving forward in his public ministry. This is one of those things where it, it does not work out the way you expected it's going to work out. This is not one of those things where, where everything is just going to go well and you just keep moving along that direction because it's going to go well. I want you to see here that, that John the Baptist was put in prison. And, and most of you know that he was, put in, he was put in prison for honoring the word of God. He was. He was put in prison because he, he was effective in his ministry to the point where he, he felt bold enough to tell the king that he should not be married to that woman. So John the Baptist, who is six months older than Jesus at least... Is, is working in public ministry and he's baptizing them and, and, and he's calling them to repentance and, and, and he's being effective in his ministry and he's well known and, and he, his physical description is in, is in the Bible. So he, he's, he's well thought of so much so that it's recorded for us to this very day. And in this particular instance, Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, prison and Jesus said, oh, I think I want to do that. <laughs> think about it from a worldly perspective. The person who he was emulating, I mean, this is not, this is separating I'm going to get really in trouble here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you that Jesus was not God because he very clearly is. But what I'm saying is if you're following someone and they go to prison for what it was they were doing, I think that's a moment of reflection, right? Yeah. You have a moment of saying, okay, do I really want to go to prison? And you have an opportunity to say, okay, I don't think I want to go to prison. I think I would rather go to discount wheel and tire. I'll get a job as a tire guy, and I'll be fine. <laughs> so I want you to see here that this is one of those things. This is, the, this is the first century church. And what we can see in the very first century was they were struggling to have church, ladies and gentlemen. They were. John, who was successful in his ministry, had just been thrown into prison. So now who's going to be taking John's place? In this particular instance, we see Jesus. Jesus has decided that he is going to step out into his public ministry for the very first time. And the event that seems to have culminated that decision for him is his cousin being thrown into prison. From John, I'm sorry, from Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, go all the way down to verse 17. I am skipping around a little bit, but it, it, it'll make sense at the end of it, I hope. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes. Okay. All right, so this is gonna, we're going we're gonna to take a test this morning. I want to see if all of you guys are qualified to do this. We're going to read the last line that's in quotation marks. I'll count down. Three, two, one. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're all qualified to preach. That was it. <laughs> in this particular instance, I want you to see that Jesus has decided that he's going to go to Galilee. And he goes to Galilee. And then, and then when he gets to Galilee, this is the very first thing that he starts to say. He starts to tell people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I want you to understand that that's the most simple message that you could ever possibly preach to someone. I want you to think about it for just a second. I want you to think about it before you leave here right now. I want you to understand that you need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then walk away. Don't stay there and argue with anybody. Don't, don't stay there and say, okay, I can prove you wrong. Don't stay there and say, no, I'm smarter than you. Say, no, no, this is what I am called to tell you by Jesus. Jesus, he said that you should repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's how Jesus Christ started his ministry, with a very simple message. It gets a little more specific, and we're going to get into some of that. But right now, I want you to see that the instructions that he's giving them are actually twofold, really and truly. And, and one of these things is that first word right there, repent. Anybody use that in the sentence this week before they came into church? Not so much, right? You hear that word in the church context all the time. So if you hear that word in the church context, do you know what the lost world doesn't have any idea what it is we're talking about when we use words that they don't know? They don't. 
So if I was to come up to Connor and say, hey, Connor, it's really important that you repent, and Connor has never been to church before, Connor might think, okay, I can do that. And then he says, okay, what does that mean? Well, you guys know I love to do this. <laughs> to turn from sin and to dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. We're actually, I'm going to get to point one a little early, we're actually telling people they need to change. And this is one of those things, like this is, when I was reading through this particular definition, I like the definition I do, I, I give them to you whether I like them or not, to turn from sin and to dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. You know what I had to find out? I was like, why would they use the word amendment there? Does anybody know what amendment is? Change. Change. Usually, ladies and gentlemen, we make amendments to change for the better. <laughs> the instruction that Jesus was giving in the first century to first century Christians and non-Christians was just this message that they needed to change and they needed to dedicate themselves to one's life. Well, what are they going to dedicate to their life? If you don't follow that message up with what they're supposed to dedicate, then okay, sure, I'll dedicate myself to donuts. You chuckle, <laughs> but you've done it before. <laughs> it's important for us to understand that Jesus started his earthly ministry in a time of great need, in a time of great distress. So what that tells us is that if we're going to be involved in ministry, we're going to be involved in times of great need and great distress. And the message that Jesus chose to deliver was not a high-minded message that you couldn't understand. It was a simple, basic message that you need to change. Not just you, but me too. Point number one for today's message. Jesus calls us to change. Now, this is where I'll, I'll start to go back to the title in just a second. Are we doing church right if we don't call people to change? But Brother Claude, the world wants us to be inclusive. I want you to be inclusive of change. <laughs> but Brother Claude, the world just wants us to accept them the way they are. That's not what Jesus told them that they were supposed to do. He didn't say come in and get comfortable. He says, I want you to repent and change. He says, I want you to understand that the way that you were before is not the way that I created you to be, that there's actually a better way. And that the better way is going to require some effort on your part. It's going to take some effort for you to change. You're going to have to make an, an amendment to your life. You're going to have to realize that what you have been doing is not what you were supposed to do. And then, when that light comes on and you realize, man, this is not what I'm supposed to do. You should ask yourself, well, what am I supposed to do? That should be the logical question. I, I understand that like, not everybody's there just yet, but ladies and gentlemen, what we're seeing here is the very beginning of Christ's Christian worldly ministry. He called people not to stay the same, but to change. And he gave them very specific instructions. So from here we're going to go to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read verses 5 through 8. Not all at once. You guys know I'm not good at that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. This is just after Jesus has called the twelve to be his disciples. It's a whole separate message I'm going to get sidetracked on here for just a second. He called the twelve to be his disciples, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to understand that he called the twelve to be his disciples. He did not call the twelve to be his church. So think about that for a second. He did not say, hey, you know what? We've got twelve people here. Now I need a building. 
And it's just going to be us 12, and it's just going to be us 12, and it's going to be us 12 until maybe maybe we'll let somebody else in the group later. No, no. He was calling people to change, and he was calling people, ladies and gentlemen, not to come in and sit down, but he was calling people to take that change out into the world. Then Jesus sent out, I'm sorry, these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of Samaria. Wait a minute. He's calling people to change. But he's telling them not to go certain places. There's a spiritual lesson here I think we've overlooked for a couple of hundred years. Why would Jesus give his 12 disciples power and authority, send them out to make change, and then tell them not to go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans? Any ideas? You ever thought about it before? Okay. It's good. I'm getting you thinking. I have an idea. I do. Remember the message was very simple that you need to change. <clears throat> very simple message. You need to change. But he told them not to go to the Gentiles and not to go to the Samaritans. Who's left? The Jews. <coughs> who, who were these 12 disciples? Jews. Think about that for just a second. He gave them a very simple message, and he gave them instructions not to go to strangers, but to go to their sphere of influence, to their family. If you can't take that simple message, repent to your family and have any success with it, how do you hope to have any excess, success going to strangers? That would be the Gentiles, the strangers. The Samaritans, they're a little worse than strangers. You guys don't like each other. It's your enemies. I want you to take this, he says. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of Samaritans. He wants you to take this very simple message to your friends, to your family, to your acquaintances, to those people who know you. Remember, it was a very simple test, and you guys all read the test, so you all passed, so you all had the ability to take this message to somebody. So the next question is, okay, well, who do I take it to? Jesus answers that question for you. He wants you to take it to, on Father's Day, your children. <laughs> on Father's Day... To your brothers. On Father's Day, to your sisters. On Father's Day, to your wife. Spiritually speaking, if you want to be a godly man, you're going to be the head of your household. If you're going to be a godly man, you're going to be the head of your household. You're going to want to do those things that God tells you you're supposed to do. And the very first thing that he told you you were supposed to do was you're supposed to change. You. You're supposed to change. And then he tells you, I don't want you taking this message out to strangers or to your enemies. I want you to take this message to your family. Because they need to change too. Verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jews were supposed to go and deliver the message to the Jews. Anybody in here Jewish? Okay, that makes you all Gentiles. You know who you get to deliver the message to? Come on, you're not even playing along. Gentiles. It's Father's Day. Think about this, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He told the Jewish disciples that had just received his message of repentance that they were going to have to take that message to the Jewish people. Now, I love this because this is one of those things that, like, there are two things in Judaism that you don't really understand as a Gentile. One is you're Jewish by birth. If your mother is Jewish, you're automatically Jewish. Automatically. In some instances, that has bled over into America, and we think, well, if my mom's Baptist, then so am I. 
And I say moms because like it's not usually the dads that are the spiritual leaders of the household on Father's Day. I'm going to pick on you men. It's not usually us that say, okay, you know what? It's time to get up. We're going to church. No, it's usually the woman in the house that says, okay, guys, breakfast is ready. Get up. We're going to go to church. She bribes us with food, so we get up, and then we go. So think about that for just a second. You are not, I'm going to pick on Carson. Carson, you're not Baptist because your mom and dad are Baptist. It doesn't, doesn't work that way in the Baptist church. Faith, you're not Baptist because your mom and dad are Baptist. Kira, you're not Baptist because your mom and dad are Baptist. In the Baptist church, ladies and gentlemen, it was the father's responsibility to come home and tell the children and, the, and their wives and their brothers and their sisters that they were supposed to change. And then that, that change becomes, how am I supposed to change? You're supposed to change to be more Christ-like. And then we deliver that message, and then, then the church is full of people because the church is full of people who have changed because they heard the word of God that said you're supposed to change. They did not hear the word of God say, it's okay, you can stay just as sinful as you are and go ahead and come on in anyway. We require some change in church, ladies and gentlemen. We do. We require that you surrender your life to Christ, not to my will, but to his will. Not to the will of the deacons or the church council, but to the will of God. The, the message was really simple in the first century. You need to change. And you need to let other people know they need to change. Don't keep that secret. So Landon, when you go to church or school or baseball practice, is baseball season over? Okay. It's incumbent upon you to change and let other people know they need to change. See, and ladies and gentlemen, I know that the world will tell us that we're supposed to be tolerant. That's not the message that Jesus was delivering. And that's not the message that Jesus was delivering I don't want any part of it. Now, we're not supposed to be hypocritical, so that requires change on our part. But we're also supposed to require change, which requires effort on the other person's part. Verse 7. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I like that. 2,000 years ago, Jesus started off with a very simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he called 12 guys to come alongside of him, and he told them to go out and do what he was doing, to say what he was saying. You see, the first century church was built by the disciples going out and obeying God. How was the 21st century built? Is it the will of the people? Is it by proxy vote? Is it, well, does it depend on whether or not there's a Democrat or Republican in office? No. Our future is clearly in the hands of God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change is required of us so we can ask other people to change as well. Verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now I get really excited at verse 8 because this is one of those things. Do you see here what he is doing? He is giving them power. He is giving them ability. He is giving them, he is giving them something, ladies and gentlemen, that the 21st century has lost. We don't, we don't claim to have these powers anymore. We don't claim to have this ability. But ladies and gentlemen, when I read this particular call and it says heal the sick, then I want to go out and heal the sick. I want to lay hands on and I want to pray. I want to see that person get well. I want to visit them in the hospital. I want to visit them in the nursing home. I want to see them get out of the hospital. I want to see them get out of the nursing home. I want to see them come back into the house of God. I want to see them... It filled with the Spirit of God. I want them to understand that when it says to cleanse the lepers, that this is giving the, the first century church a requirement to go out and to take care of those people that the rest of the world wanted nothing to do with. Think I'm excited. Think about that. Heal the sick and cleanse the lepers. Ladies and gentlemen, he's asking the church, the first century church, to set themselves up in this particular manner. I want you to go out and I want you to find people who are sick and I want you to find people who are dying and I want you to tell them that they need to repent, they need to change. I don't want you to comfort them and say it's going to be all right. It 
you tell them that? Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Now, that third one, raise the dead. Just hit you right there in the heart. I, I don't think, because there are no scriptural accounts of this, I don't think that any of those 12 disciples said, okay, where's the closest funeral home? I don't think any of them rushed out to the closest cemetery and said, okay, everybody, get up! <laughs> I'm not going to try that myself. <laughs> Raising the dead is the difference between life and death. It's the, it's the difference between not changing and changing. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between knowing that God is your father and welcoming him into your life or spending your entire life lost, wandering around in the wilderness, waiting to be devoured by the lion, or surrendering your life to Christ and changing. That raised the dead part. People get all of you been out of shape. Claude, you don't really think that that's what he meant, do you? No, I don't, I don't think that he was telling them to go to the local cemetery and to dig anybody up because there's no scriptural account of that happening. You know what they did? They went out and they told people who were lost that they needed to be saved, ladies and gentlemen, and that happened. 3,000 in a day, 5,000 in a day. What's our record? Four? The first century church was to told to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. You don't know anybody with demons, ladies and gentlemen? Do you not know anybody? <laughs> freely you have received, freely give. What have you received? They had received the words of God that said, repent. They were supposed to be just as freely giving those words away so that other people who were sick, they could be healed. So that lepers could be cleansed. So that the dead could come to life. Life in Christ. So that the demons could be cast out. So you're no longer held sway by alcoholism or drug addiction or pornography. Cast out demons. He didn't say just open your arms and let them all come in and just waller in their sickness. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Point number two. Point number two is one that I think the church has done wrong for probably just about 2,000 years. Probably. <laughs> I do like that one. I should have spaced it up a little bit. We are agents of change. We are. The church is supposed to change first, us. Second, our families. Third, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, drive out demons. I want the church in 2021 to be as strong as and powerful as a church in one. The very first church, those 12 disciples that Jesus has called together, he says, I want you to come in, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to repent. Now, I'm going to send you out, but I don't want you to go to the people that you don't know, and I don't want you to go to the people that you hate. I want you to go to your people. That was the first century commandment. Don't go to the Gentiles. They're not your people. Don't go to the Samaritans. You guys hate each other. Go to the Jews. Go to the lost in the Jewish church. Now, the great thing about that was, I, and I didn't spend much time on that particular section of that verse, but he actually sent the disciples to go to the Jewish people who already thought that they were saved because they were Jewish. 
And he said, I want you to tell those Jewish people that think that they're saved because they're Jewish. I want you to tell those people they have to change. They have to repent, right? They can't continue to think that they're going to heaven just because of their culture. They have to decide, do they want to invite me into their heart and into their life? Point number one was really changed and required by us. Point number two is really because of our change, we're supposed to motivate the entire world to change. You know how you cannot do that? If you don't change. If you come home and sit down with the remote control in your hand and have dinner in your lap, and then try and tell someone else they need to exercise. <laughs> They're going to look at you and think that you are nuts. But if you come home after working eight hours at work, take a shower, jump into your gym clothes, and run back to the gym. When you get to the gym, you work out for an hour, and you come home, and you're sweating, and you're tired, and you're miserable. And then one of your friends stops by and says, hey, what you been doing? You can say, I've been changing. I've been working hard to be better than who I was. You see, there's a, there's a difference between when someone looks at you and they can see that you're telling the truth, and when they look at you and they can tell you're just being a hypocrite. We don't need any more hypocrites. We need change agents. We need agents of change that will get up in the morning and think, you know what, before I get started, I need to spend some time in the study of the Word of God. And open your Bible and read a passage. Start in Genesis 1.1. If you can only read that one passage the next day, do Genesis 1-2. You will eventually finish the entire Bible or God will call you home. One of those two things will happen. But Christ, in the very first century, gathered 12 guys together and didn't say, Okay, I want you guys to keep fishing. I want you to keep collecting taxes. He says, No, no. I want you to be agents of change. I want you to go out into the world and I want you to tell them the difference that it makes to be a child of God. I want them to see it in your walk. I want them to understand that what you're asking them to do is something that you're already prepared to do yourself. You see, the church was never, never instructed by God to be tolerant. We weren't. Well, that sounds wrong. Sounds biblical. And if it offends your ears to think that maybe we should be agents of change, then, then, then maybe you're not really spending much time in the study of the Word of God. But if you can find anywhere in here where he asks us to accept somebody and not to help them change, I'll preach that message next week. Because I promise you it's not in there. From Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, we're going to go to Ephesians 1. This is where I'm supposed to start cheering you up, not be so heady. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 4 and 5. I'm going to read verse 4 with a little commentary and then verse 5. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is that verse where I'll ask you, does that describe you? Are, are you holy and without blame before God? If you are, great. If you are not, it's time to change. Repent. Make amendments to your life for the better. <laughs> Make amendments to your life for the glory of God. And then look at this. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love.
there's a lot of deep theological conversations I could start right here. But in, in verse 5, actually, we'll read verse 5. <laughs> Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. When you read verse 5 and it says predestined, that's when the theologians just open a can of worms and go, okay, let's argue now. Well, what are you predestined to do? And then think about this. Reading verse 4 and verse 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, before the world was formed, God has chosen you. God has chosen you and he has predestined you. He's chosen you and he's predestined you to do what? Look back at verse 5. To be sons by adoption of Jesus Christ. God predestined you to be a child of God. I don't know why we argue about that. I can't think of a greater honor. God, before the foundation of the world, looked down and he chose who? Us. To do what? To be his children. And people say, well, no, if he chose some people to be predestined and then he chose them to be, be sons of God, then he must, have, he must have chosen other people to go to hell. That's not what the Bible says. Predestination is a word you should all love. God predestined you for adoption. Free will is a word that should make you upset because free will will have you choosing the wrong choice every time. People get upset when you say that they're predestined. Like, no, I'm not. I have free will. No, no. You were preordained by God to be a child of God. In God's grace and his love, he gives you the ability to mess that up. Your free will should make you mad. Because your free will is what gives you the ability to say, I don't want to go to heaven. I'd rather go to hell. You were predestined to be adopted. By God. Before the foundations of the world, God knew he was going to create you, and he wanted you to be his child forever and ever and ever in all of eternity. But if he forces that on you, then where's the love? So he says, I'm not going to make them be my children. I'm going to create them to be my children, and I'm going to give them this thing called free will. Don't be upset by being predestined. You were predestined for glory. Be upset that your free will messes that up. Be so upset that your free will messes that up, ladies and gentlemen, that you are prepared to repent and change. And when you change, what you are changing is you're changing your free will for that of God. And you're giving up the things that you want to do and the things that you want to say. And instead, you're going to do those things that God created you to do. And you're going to say those things God created you to say. You were predestined by God to be a child of God for the glory of God. And we mess that up so much that Christ gets here on earth. And in the very first century, he says, okay, I've got a simple message for you. You messed up. What am I supposed to do? Change. What am I supposed to change into? The likeness of Christ. This last Bible verse helps us with that a little bit. Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. I don't make any of this up, guys. This is the word of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Dun, dun, dun. If we had a drum roll, I'd ask for a drum roll. Carlo, got a drum roll back there? <laughs> Carlo said no. 1 John chapter 2. Thank you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How did Jesus walk? He walked around telling other people they needed to change. 
I know in 2021, that's offensive, Brother Claude. If I stop somebody and say, well, you need to change, remember who he told you you were supposed to deliver that message to. Not to strangers, not to people you hate, to your family. Your family has judged you already. If you come home from church and tell them something, they're not going to judge you any differently than they already have. What they're going to do is they're going to wait and see whether or not you're walking out those things you're telling them to walk out. Are we doing church right in 2021? And this is the thing, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that if we were doing church the way they were doing church in the first century, we would get the results they were getting in the first century. And the first century church changed the whole world. We won't even ask somebody to change. They might get offended. They might, they might call me a Christian. I might hurt their feelings. I would rather go home to my family and ask them to change and spend eternity with them in heaven than go home and let my family just be as messed up as they are and spend all of eternity in hell. Point number three for today's message. Soon. We were created to be Christ-like, to call people to change, to call them to repentance. And we're supposed to start, ladies and gentlemen, with our own family. Not with strangers, not with people you hate, but the people who know you the best. The people who have already judged you, so you don't have to worry about, well, Brother Claude, if I go and tell them that, then they're going to judge me. They already did. It's okay. You know they did. Brother Claude, they might not believe. They might not. But if you start walking out that change in your life, they might. I promise you, if you don't ask them to change, they will keep doing it wrong. Because that's my experience. See, I've done things for a very long time, and I've done them wrong. And I didn't know that I could do them any better until somebody said, Hey, Brother Claude, why don't you try it like this? And then it worked, and I thought, well, why didn't I do that all of the time? I just needed somebody to help me change. The church, ladies and gentlemen, is an agent of change. The church, ladies and gentlemen, the church, ladies and gentlemen, is supposed to deliver the message that Christ delivered. You need to change. The church, ladies and gentlemen, is not supposed to just gather on Sunday and sit down and be entertained. The church, ladies and gentlemen, the first century church that changed the world still has that power today if we just do what God asks us to do. Was Christy going to come and lead us in a song? I don't remember which one it was. Brother Virgil, will you come to the remember table, please? This is the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. If you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you have the ability to make that change right here, right now. Come down front and see Brother Virgil. This is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. If you have been convinced by this world that we are just supposed to be tolerant of everything and change nothing, then come to the altar. And pray for God to give you the strength to change, and he will. But don't sit there and miss an opportunity to change because God created you to be one of his. Don't miss that opportunity.
because we have two of our children coming forward to accept Jesus Christ. Uh, Riley Snyder and Kinley McCauley. They're wanting to come to join the church through baptism. Do we have a motion to accept? Do we have a second? Okay. You know, all in favor say we love you. We love you. Can be opposed. All right, after service, you come up and if you feel comfortable, rub off and tell them you're praying for them, be there for them. All right. Um, Brother Bob Mallow, you mind praying out loud for us and dismissing the show? Sure.